Greetings and welcome to Unit 10, Interest Groups and Lobbying in Texas. In this lecture, we will define the essential characteristics of interest groups and why they form, identify the various interest group typologies, analyze the techniques used by interest groups to influence Texas government, and discuss how interest groups are regulated here in the great state of Texas. We have some ground to cover, so without further delay, let's dive right into this. Okay, so what is an interest group? Okay. An interest group is any formal association of individuals or organizations that attempt to influence government decision making and or the making of public policy. That is to say, you know, uh, legislation passed by the legislature or the implementation of laws by the executive. Okay? So some examples of interest groups, uh, there are a host of interest groups out there. Okay? A very wide range of interest groups. But to give you an example of a few here, um, we have the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, we have the United to End Genocide, uh, Campaign for Working Families, and Americans for Democratic Action. So let's move on and talk about lobbying. Uh, so lobbying is an attempt to influence policy by persuading a government policy-making official, like a legislator, or the implementation of that policy, you know, um, like the governor or uh, someone in the executive branch. So, let me let there's some nuance here that I think that we need to dive into just a little bit. Okay, so notice when we define an interest group, we're looking at a formal association of individuals or organizations. Well, lobbying here can be anyone. It can be you. Or it could be me. Lobbying, anyone can be, anyone can engage in lobbying. Anyone. Uh, it doesn't matter the employer, uh, the education level, or any other personal characteristic for which may apply to us. Okay? It doesn't matter. Anyone can lobby. Because let me give you a definition of a lobbyist. Okay? Definition of a lobbyist is anyone who is willing to wait in the lobby of a legislator. That's a lobbyist. Okay? Um, so, now, it's true, true, that when we say lobbyist, when we think of a lobbyist, we are typically referring to someone who is hired by an interest group to represent said interest within, the, within a legislative body. This is true. This is true. But anyone can be a lobbyist. Anyone. Anyone who's willing to wait in the lobby to talk to the representative to say, hey, I want, I hope you support this bill. Or, hey, I hope you do not support this bill, whatever the bill may be, whatever the interest you are interested in. Right? This idea that you're, you're trying to persuade their, their, their decision making. You're trying to influence their decision making process. Now, this can also be done, by the way, uh, by meeting them in person, by waiting in the lobby, or it can be done by via email, or uh, contact them via phone, whatever the case may be. Uh, so, lobbying is just an attempt to influence the decision-making process of an elected official. Uh, um, and this can be done by anyone. It could be done by you, it could be done by me. Or it could be done by an individual who is hired by, uh, by an organization, by an interest group. So let's talk real quick about the struggle between factions and freedom. Okay? Uh, the Federalist Papers number 10, uh, authored, by the way, by James Madison, supported the existence of groups, i.e. factions, as, uh, as an individual freedom despite the concerns over the potential power they may impose. Now, there's always this struggle, right? There's always this struggle. Um, think of it like this, right? 
while we may be loud, and we may know some people who are very loud, <laughs> right? Um, one voice, while it can be loud, I agree, um, compare that to a hundred people, or a thousand, or a million people, right? There's almost this risk of tyranny of the majority, right? That these that we can create these factions where um, the majority is so is so loud, so strong that uh, whatever the minority the minority group is just left in the dust, right? That's kind of the fear here. Now, what's interesting is that James Madison, who penned uh, the Federalist Papers, is also the same individual who penned the U.S. Bill of Rights. Now, you may recall that the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights uh, protects from government intrusion on five particular freedoms, right? In order, though, we, uh, put, uh, we have freedom of religion that's protected from government intrusion. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of the press. We have the freedom of assembly and the freedom to uh, get a redress of grievances by the government. Okay? So I want to dive into this just a little bit. Now, I know I've always spoken about uh, free speech and how you know, we do have free speech and we have absolute free speech. Because there is no you know, government device bridling my tongue or a chip in my mind that's, uh, that dictates what I can and cannot say. Now I know I've already touched on that, but there's one thing I want. To, there's one other thing I want to touch on about this. This freedom, there's a little bit of uh, responsibility with it, right? And that we do, we can say what we want, when we want, how we want. But certain speech, certain, not all, obviously, but certain speech, there are consequences for that, right? For example, I can't yell fire in a crowded theater, okay? Um, now let's move on to peacefully assemble. Now, often when we think about this, right, we put it in the context of politics. Right? We put it in, in the context of protesting, that, that we have the right to peacefully come together to protest, I don't know, a piece of legislation, to protest government action or protest government inaction, right? Whatever the case may be, we have, we have that right. And that's a good frame to put it in. But peacefully to assemble applies to way more other things than simply protesting or politics for that matter. For example, uh, peacefully assembly, uh, we have the right to peacefully assemble to go to church, right? To assemble to go to church. We have the right to, um, you know, um, uh, you know, for students to come together in a classroom to learn. Well, the, the, the assembly also applies to, you know, getting together with your friends to have a chess tournament or to play a land party game. Um, or or it, it, can, it also applies to those who want to get into a group to discuss the merits of Marvel movies or DC movies, right? It applies to way more than just politics, okay? Or... Or it, it also applies to people who want to come together for a common cause, whatever that cause may be, okay? So, yeah. And then petition the government for redress of grievances. All right, we, we have, the, the Bill of Rights put this limitation on government that they cannot intrude on our right to tell the government, hey, there's a problem over here, fix it. Or hey, you're doing this wrong. What are you doing? Stop it. Right? Uh, we have the right to do that. And the Constitution, through the Bill of Rights, uh, protects the government from limiting our ability to tell them that. So, it sounds like I might be talking more about civil liberties right now than, than uh, interest groups. So, what's the point here? Well, the point is this. It leads us to interest groups. I mean, think about it. Use free speech, right? Uh, but interest groups use free speech all the time to uh, communicate, you know, ideas and preferences. Uh, they assemble, whether it's, you know, uh, through meeting, monthly meetings or by 
uh, asking for the membership to come out and protest. Um, and the right to petition government for redress of grievances. The gov interest groups tell the government, hey, there is an issue here. Fix it. <laughs> right? This leads us directly into interest groups. So not only do we have a component here where we have the right recipe, with the right environment for this to exist, we can move on now to understanding why then interest groups are created. We have the right political environment, i.e. Uh, civil liberties, that allow us to do this. But why, do they, why are they actually created? Well, political scientists, we've identified three reasons. And these reasons help us to explain why they're created and also help us to understand why we join them. Let's, dive, let's, let's take a look into this, okay? So, we've identified, political scientists, we've identified uh, three reasons. The, one, of the reason, one of the reasons is material. Right? that we receive discounts on products or services for joining or being a part of an interest group. So what does that look like? Well, um, it could be a uh, free subscription to a magazine of sorts. It could be um, a discount on, uh, on, on like your dinner when you go out to eat um, for certain interest groups. Right? Those are some examples, but there's some kind of material good that you get from it by joining. There's also this solidarity component here. You know, you're gathering with other people who share a similar interest. You're with like-minded people, right? I mean, this makes sense. There's something to be said here, right? There's something powerful here about being with like-minded people that you share a common similar interest, right? And especially if it ties into our ideology <laughs> with our belief system, right? I mean, it makes sense. And lastly, purposive. That is the satisfaction of working towards a common cause. Right? You're working with others to achieve, a, to achieve an objective. Right? And when you achieve that objective, how sweet is that victory? Right? And that's the point here. These are the three reasons um, that help explain why interest groups are formed and why we potentially join them. Uh, so let's move on now to the types of interest groups. And there's about five that we need to become familiar with that operate here in Texas. Okay? Uh, so there's trade associations. Uh, trade associations are groups of companies involved in the same business. Uh, so the Texas Association of Realtors, uh, the Texas Bankers Association, and the Texas Automobile Dealers Association. These are three predominant examples here in Texas. We also have uh, professional associations. They are like, they are similar to trade associations, but with individual rather than company members. So some examples, uh, the Texas Nurses Association and the Texas Association of Professional Engineers are two major Texas professional associations here in Texas. We also have labored, uh, organized labor associations or interest groups. Um, but it should be noted that while union members account for less than 5% of wage and salary workers here in Texas, unions play a predominant role in the political process, specifically if, uh, if we looked at the national level. Okay? Uh, so the most predominant uh, group for labor in Texas is the, F, is the AFL-CIO. Um, and we and they have a little bit of competition with the SEIU Texas, which they specialize in government and service workers. We also have uh, eth racial, ethnic, and minority groups, uh, um, interest groups. Right. So we have the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. We have the League of 
uh, United Latin American citizens known as LULAC. And we have Equality Texas Advocate. And lastly, we have religious groups, religious interest groups. Um, this, can, this ranges from the Texas, uh, sorry, the Baptist Christian Life Commission, the Texas Christian Coalition, and the Heritage Alliance. So let me ask you, let me ask you here. Which interest group, which type of interest group would you join? And do you have a specific one in mind? Maybe you do. Which one would you join? And why? Let me know, because I'm fascinated. I'm curious to know, of these types, which one would you, which one would you join? And what's your reasoning? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, so let's move on. Let's talk about how these interest groups influence Texas government. Well, let's dive right in, okay? So we have electioneering, right? Uh, groups influencing who the policy makers will be. So let's take a moment here to dive into this, okay? Let, let's, let's take a moment to dissect this. So we've seen, we've talked about how, you know, Interest groups try to influence public policy. We, we've seen lobbying trying to influence the um, decision-making process of our elected officials. But let's talk now. Now this dives a little bit. This is a different dive. This is a different thing here, right? Because instead of influencing what government will do, electioneering is influencing who is in government. So this takes a couple of forms that we can talk about, right? Um, everything from campaign contributions, right? You're going to support specific candidates that are in line with your, with, with, with the interest group's um, interest, right? Uh, this, this could be running campaign ads, endorsing candidates, etc. Well, federal law places limits on the amount of money that can in fact be raised and contributed to federal elections, federal races. Texas, however, with Texas law, we permit groups to form political action committees or PACs. We'll talk more about them uh, towards the end, but bear with me. Uh, so these groups are permitted to form uh, that can receive and donate unlimited amount of money to state and local election campaigns. So we see some limitations apply to federal elections, but uh, county and statewide, we don't have that limitation. Okay. So let's talk now about the funding incumbent rule. Uh, now, we, you may recall that an incumbent, right, is someone who currently holds office, okay? Uh, so, in the 2016 uh, presidential election, who was the incumbent there? That's right. It was President Trump. And who was the challenger? Biden. Correct. Yes. So, what we saw, so we saw, we see that, right? The incumbent is just the the uh, current office holder, the challenger, is challenging the incumbent, right? So, the funding incumbent rule is just this informal practice. In other words, it's, it's not really written in stone. It's not necessarily a rule or a law, but it's just an informal practice that's understood. Um, of a, so, this practice avoids supporting challengers to incumbent legislators. Even though um, the challenger may actually be more in line with the interest group's interest. Now, why would they want to? Why would they do that? Well, in short, um, fear of retaliation. I mean, think about it. If it is rare for incumbents to lose, I mean, it's that's not an absolute statement. Okay, incumbents do lose. They do. But it's uh, especially when we talk about legislators, and they often get reelected. Once you become the incumbent, it, it's it's hard to uh, for a challenger to defeat them. 
is that's not to say it's impossible. That's not to say that we haven't seen it because we have. It's just it's 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 hard. Okay, it's a harder battle. Well, this field retaliation from the incumbent when they win re-election to that interest of that interest group. Okay. Again, challengers rarely win. And let's talk about empty wards. Let's talk about empty wards here. Because this is at play here, right? When you're seeking election, right, wards are cheap. We'll say whatever we need to to get attention to, to get elected. Maybe that's a pessimistic view, and I'll agree it might be. But the point here is that wards are cheap. Now, the incumbent has something that's known as a voting record. That is to say that there is a record of how they voted. In other words, they have experience that can be predictable. Right? Once you have a voting record, it's kind of easy to predict how you're going to vote based upon how you voted in the past. And even though an incumbent may not fully, maybe they're not fully compatible with that particular interest or that interest group because of you know ideology, whatever the case may be, There's a sense of predictability there that the challenger just doesn't have. I'm taking a very long way of saying this, but in short, actions speak louder than words. Or in this case, a voting record speaks louder than words. Promises can be made, and just as easily they can be broken. Right? That's the point here. That's the point. You may, pro uh, in other words, uh, to, to say this in another way, uh, a, a challenger can say whatever they want to be as attractive as possible to as many interest groups as possible. But those wards can just simply be that, just wards, em empty wards. Huh? I'm digressing. Let's continue on with grassroots lobbying. Okay, so we spoke, we spoke about grassroots movements let's this is a little different right let's talk about grassroots lobbying okay this is grassroots lobbying is getting large numbers of constituents to contact their legislators on a, on a behalf of a particular issue right so we saw with we saw with you know lobbying you're, you're trying to influence the decision making process of legislators with electioneering we are seeing influencing who will be the uh, policy maker. Well, with grassroots lobbying, what we see here is exactly that, P building up pressure from the constituents, from you and I, to encourage us to reach out to our legislator and be like, hey, there is this issue, fix it. Or hey, stop doing this thing that over here, right? Whatever the case may be. And the point is, is that getting large numbers of constituents to contact the legislators um, instead of, instead of uh, interest groups. Now, why, how is that powerful? Or why does that matter? Why, why, why is this a thing? Well, think about it like this, right? Who are representatives, legislators, who are they accountable to? Is it interest groups or is it their constituents? That's right, constituents. Right? So with that said, right, it is powerful when you have constituent after constituent after constituent after constituent reaching out to an office going, hey, about this issue. Hey, about this issue. Oh, hey, yeah, hope you're doing well, but hey, about this issue. <laughs> Right? This idea is you're getting the people involved and that they're the ones. And since constituents are the ones voting for them, they pay more attention to. Does that make sense? That's why. Anyways, so legislators, they do meet with, the, with voters in, the, in their district. Now, think about this one through, right? So... A good legislator, a good representative, will come back to the district. They will. 
because they want to meet with the people. And this is an opportunity. This is a two-way street. Okay, It's an opportunity for them to give us an update about what's going on in the legislature. Uh, it's, an up, it's a way for them to tell us about you know ish, upcoming issues. It's also a way for you and I to tell them what we think about a particular issue, um, about a particular event, or just to give them an update from our point of view. Does that make sense? So th this, this meeting with the legislators, because they do come back to the districts, um, this, is, this is an important exchange of information. This is a significant component here. And when they do come back, right, um, legislators, they meet with important supporters, whether it be campaign contributors, right, or local party officials. I mean, that's right. Remember that the workhorse for a political party is, in fact, at the county level. Right? Uh, they host events, town hall meetings, etc., um, that serve many purposes. But a couple of those purposes is this, is that these town hall type like meetings are a way to showcase, hey, look at what our member in government has done. Let's let you know it, it builds up name recognition and it, it provides more visibility of that of that candidate in the upcoming election, right? Um, but it's also a way for the uh, for the party members to go, hey, we have this issue that we think that the legislature needs to act on. What's your plan? Or hey, what are you doing with that support of that bill? Can you explain that to us? Because otherwise, it doesn't look good from our point of view, right? It allows accountability, right? Uh, it's kind of an informal accountability of going, hey, give us, uh, here's an update, right? From both sides. And of course, meeting with local government officials, uh, you know, um, members who serve in county government have the ability to tell state legislators, hey, we have this issue, and it would be great if you could help us out with this, right? This is, it's a way to exchange information and a way to, uh, to continue efficiency with governing. Ah. So let's, let's move on now. Let's move on to another way that lobbyists impacts, influence Texas government. So you may recall that the Texas legislature is classified as a part-time legislature. That is to say that um, they meet once every two years for 140 days. True, the governor can call him back for a special session, but the regular session is, um, is determined to just be 140 days. Okay, so let's consider now the 2019 Texas legislative session. Okay, they had to look at, or they looked at, or should I say they, uh, 10,877 individual bills and resolutions were introduced in that Texas le legislative session. Okay, That's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of bills to go through. Imagine having to read 10,877 essays. <laughs> That's what we're looking at here, right? So part-time legislators cannot possibly know uh, how each of those bills that are proposed changes in state law might have an impact on various industries and other interests unless representatives of those groups tell them. Right? So this idea is that this service that lobbyists provide is simply this, knowledge. 10,877 bills. Right? This is, this, this is a lot of information to sift through, to go through, to try to understand. And so lobbyists provide this service of basically helping, because you got to remember, right? Lobbyists are often uh, experts within, now again, when I say lobbyists, I'm referring to those individuals who are hired <laughs> by interest groups, right? To represent that interest in like a legislative body. So these people are often experts within the field, right? So they bring some expertise with them and they can talk about and inform about the impacts that these bills will have. 
because they have a invested interest <laughs> in this uh, in this particular piece of legislation or pieces of legislation. Okay. So another component here is simply legislators. Frankly, they rely on interest groups for information. Again, these are experts, typically uh, within the within that particular interest, who can speak at nauseum about effects, uh, about uh, characteristics, and how the legislature can help with those. Okay, they're typically experts. So let me ask you a question here, and I really am curious about your thoughts. I really am. I want to know. Do you think this is cheating? I mean. After all, our legislators are elected by us to do this job. Is this, are legislators using interest groups as a crutch? And is that a form of cheating? Or, because they are part-time, they do need additional help, outside help. Now, what's interesting to note, and I want to take a moment here, just, just a few minutes here, to talk about this real fast. We have to realize, right, that interest groups are biased. And let's, let's be clear, not all bias is inherently evil, okay? Uh, case in point, um, Marvel or DC, which one's better? Well, we have a biased opinion about that, and that's fine, right? Uh, Chick-fil-A or McDonald's? Right? Well, we have a biased response to that question. So that's fine, right? I mean, right? Democrat or Republican, we're biased, and that's fine. But what's not fine, right, is a judge showing bias in a court proceeding, right? That's not okay for various reasons. Uh, and we, we right, uh, that fair, uh, fair and speedy trial. That's a, a judge that's biased one way or the other. That violates that constitutional protection, right? So, uh, so the point I'm trying to get at here is not all bias is is inherently bad. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. But as long as we recognize that, as long as we recognize that, right? Uh, but the point here is these lobbyists. They're biased because they have an invested interest. Right? So is this a form of cheating? I don't know. Let me know because I I'm, I'm really am curious to know your thoughts on this. All right. So let's talk about some regulation here in Texas because we do see regulation of interest groups. All right. So let's talk about the Texas Ethics Commission. Um, this is the commission that does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, they help regulate ethic, uh, ethnic concern, ethics, rather, I should say, ethics concerns with public officials. So a lobbyist, um, they're required. Uh, there's an annual registration fee for lobbyists, and which is $750. They have to pay every year. Uh, there is a, re the, that fee is reduced. If that person is representing a nonprofit group, now I want to make sure I'm clear about this. Right? Remember my definition of a lobbyist, right? And that you and I could be lobbyists. No, this does not apply to us. Right? We do not have to register and pay an annual fee. Right? We do not have to do that at all. This applies to those individuals who are hired by a group by an interest group or by an organization to represent that interest within like a legislative body, for example. Okay. So just let's just keep that in mind. Right. So gifts to elected officials are limited to $500 per year. This is another form of a regulation to help keep us at, um, to make sure ethics are in fact uh, preserved. <laughs> Uh, so any gift that's valued at more than $50 must be reported to the TEC or the Texas Ethics Commission. Uh, and it should be noted that there are fines up to $10,000 
and criminal punishments as high as second degree felony, um, which may be pursued against violators. Right? So we do see some regula- uh, we do see some regulation of interest groups. And let's be clear, right? That regulation is not necessarily inherently evil, right? Um, there some some regulation is required to ensure that we are on the up and up, right? Now, to what degree and how far you want to take that? Of course, that's up to ideology, right? But the point here is that regulation uh, helps protect. It can help protect the integrity of elected officials and of our government. I digress. Political Action Committees, okay, PACs, uh, 527 organization. Uh, so this is like a, so these numbers we're about to look into, right? Uh, um, uh, 527s, uh, 501c3s, or 501c whatever. Uh, these are uh, designation, uh, IRS designation, uh, no, designators to help with tax purposes, okay? But it's referring to specific types of groups. We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but they are, uh, these PACs can pool uh, campaign contributions from members and donates those funds to campaigns for or against candidates, data initiatives, or pieces of legislation, okay? Um, now, PACs, super, uh, sorry, PACs, uh, political action committees, uh, they are formed by designating a, an official treasurer who must then file contribution and expenditure reports twice a year, with additional reports due prior to any election in which that particular interest group is involved in. So we see, we, 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 while we do see PACs being able to raise unlimited amount of money and to spend unlimited amount, they do have to disclose that information, right? All right, so let's talk about dark money. And this will wrap up this, this lecture here. So dark money refers to political spending by nonprofit organizations, okay? So for example, 501c4s, uh, social welfare associations, uh, 501Cs, uh, these, these refer to unions, and 501C6 refers to trade, or, trade groups. Uh, but they are not required to disclose their donors. So we don't know where the money is coming from. That's the reason why it's referred to dark money. All right. So as always, there's something I said that didn't quite make sense or that you have a question about, please feel free to reach out to me. Until next time, peace.